Hello and welcome to the BizDev Podcast, the podcast about developing your business. I'm your host today, Gary Voigt, and I am joined by our amazing marketing director, Christy Pronto. Hello, everyone. And today we're here to discuss topics ranging from tech news, software development, small business, startups, leadership, strategies for growth, and everything in between. It sounds like a lot, but they're all kind of related. So we'll try to keep you mildly entertained as we go. And today we are joined by our special guest, Josh Fuller. And Josh is the founder and CEO of Matic Digital. How are you doing, Josh? I'm doing well. Thanks for uh, having me today. Thank you for joining us. So we're going to get into your journey and your company. Um, just wanted to start off with a few things that are a little bit off topic. As I was looking through the website, there was two things that I noticed for Matic Digital. And uh, one of them struck me immediately, like a detective I keyed in on right away. Um, on your About Us page, in one of the images, in the background, there's a Frankie Hill skateboard. <laughs> I don't know if you know whose it is, but I'm curious to find out whose Frankie Hill skateboard that is. Because that's vintage uh, Powell Peralta Frankie Hill skateboard. <laughs> no one in this audience is going to care about this except me, but I have to know. I'm so happy we're starting here. Yeah, that's mine, man. I'm a, I'm a oh, massive sick. fan of, of that era of skateboarding and even a little older. And uh, my, my office at home has a couple of uh, Mike Vallelis. Um And then, yeah, at, at the studio, we've got um, a really cool vintage Steve Cavallaro and, and the Frankie Hill, which is still looking for a home on the wall. Um, and I, I ride a, a, a Ray Barbie is my kind of ride around, but a newer, a newer edition Ray Barbie. So big on the okay, power. I think we're just going to skip the whole tech talk. And I think me and Josh are just going to talk about skateboarding because I can go on this topic forever. He literally <laughs> was just saying that he was going to put skateboards on the wall in his office. So yeah. Okay. yeah. And I grew up skateboarding started in the eighties. Oh, Perfect. cool. That's the That's one I nice. keep right, right next to me. I clearly don't do very many tricks anymore, but uh, it, it's a great way to keep up with my, my daughter uh, when she's on her scooter. So, uh -huh. oh, See, I actually I convinced my daughter to skate with me, and she did for a little while, and then she got into other things in school, and skateboarding took a back seat. So that means I didn't get to go to the park as much as I would like, but I still roll around. I may not be doing it right. I don't, know if I'm, I don't know if I'm making it look fun. I, I, <laughs> I might look awkward. It doesn't matter how it looks. It matters how... <laughs> Nah. So skateboarding, actually, you'll find through, um, I know your company is a digital branding company and you do a lot of creative. And I've, throughout my career here as a designer, noticed that a lot of other designers and people that I've worked with in the creative fields do have a little bit of a background in skateboarding. Skateboarding and music huh. seem to cross over a lot into the creative fields. I don't yeah. know if you've noticed that as well. Absolutely. It was music to my ears when we, we built out our studio this summer and uh, one of our account directors, Bryce, was was the first one. He actually instigated the skateboards on the wall notion. I, I, I didn't try and prescribe that. It just that's what they that's what he wanted. And then the team kind of got around it. So now we have like six of them hanging around the office. Um, and yeah, uh, half the other people are in musicians like. We do a weekly PTO and my content director, he lives uh, in New York actually. And he, uh, his notice was, uh, I, I need to block these couple of hours on these couple of days for, we're, we're doing some recording in the studio with his band. So it's just, nice. oh, cool. yeah, we all have the same. I don't know, but then my studio lead, uh, she took up ballet. So I, I, I think just <laughs> in this industry, just, they just all have a thing. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a fun. It's a fun trivia. It always creative out. outlet. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Speaking about your studio, um, why don't you give us just like the the broad overview of what you guys do at Matic Digital? Yeah, so we are a product and strategy design practice. Um, build, you know, a lot of kind of functional frameworks for either uh, newly forming or already up and running organizations, all, all kinds of sizes from, from enterprise to startup. Um, and, you know, with that, we, we really focus more on the tangible, the, the overall brand perception and user experience. We, we try and, you know, pull those threads through. A lot of times there can be a drop off between them. Um, 
in we do some development as well though we're we're considering um looking at just focusing 100 percent on on the design and strategy um, piece and content inherently is a part of that but you know we've done large financial tech platforms and smaller web flow marketing sites. So sort of, you know, everything in between there, ultimately all of those, all those interfaces and endpoints re require, you know, collecting um, and, and aligning on what we're saying and who we're saying it to, to kind of drive those reactions from the user base. So if it has a, if it's going to have another set of eyes on it, we, we, uh, we work on it. Nice. That actually aligns with a lot of what we do at Big Pixel. Uh, we are a little bit more focused on the actual development part of it. But as far as working with everything from startups to enterprises, from trying to keep their brand in line with the product that they're building or creating a brand forum for the product and then moving through, you know, from just the initial concept all the way through to completion, that's a very similar path. Um, same thing yeah, with Webflow. Yeah. <laughs> Webflow marketing sites. Typically, we do those for companies that we're already doing other projects for. We don't focus on just the websites, but we'll build Same. them for, you know, as a secondary part of the business for one of the larger clients we have. Now, does your team also work with existing, like, development? Like, in other words, if there was an enterprise company that hired you to do something specific, are you working along yep. their dev team, too? Absolutely. Getting a little more in the triage or, you know, even... Uh, I get made fun of because I use this word a lot, but like being surgical. So if something exists, we're in here to augment or affect an area without breaking any other areas. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, a lot of scaling from from current, but you know, a lot of a lot of the business that's sort of come in, and we're only you know just to turn two, so we're still um, figuring out us and and figuring out what we. You know, there's a lot of things you can do in the strategy, design, and development arena, and as you know. And um, but then it, it, you you want to start to focus on okay, well, what do we like doing? What do we like the most? And and more so, where are we taking the biggest guesses at success versus where we know every time this this thing was scoped right, we're gonna hit the marks. Um, and, and so we're we're always sort of reflecting and refining on that, but. Um, yeah, as of, you know, in our second year, we, we've jumped into to things where the water was pretty warm already. And and then a lot of it's like, oh, we have this, we want to change everything. So a, a lot of full refresh, which has its own, you know, it's it's much more difficult at times than when mm -hmm. you're dealing with, you know, starting out with a white page and just, you know, okay, what are we building? Like the paper napkin uh, example is, is it's fun to say, we think that way. We can start from nothing and go. The truth is, I think it's actually a lot more, uh, a lot, the, the barrier to entry to getting to an MVP and to getting to a positive outcome is, is so much more straight line, straightforward when you are starting from zero versus when you're starting from, we're doing 10 million a year, we don't want to disrupt this, uh, but we want to do a full replatform. Uh, go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're still in the, in the business of both, but I, I think, you know, as, as we continue to mature, um, as, as a practice area of, you know, where do we want to be known for and what's the thing, what's our elevator, uh, at now Matic, that's like you know? a, that's a confident approach, especially you said you're only like two years old. Is that what you said? Yeah. The company's only two yeah, years yeah. old. So usually in this phase of a smaller business from what we've seen and companies we've worked with, I mean, the first year is going to be just figuring out how to get clients. And then the second year is figuring out how to get more or just how to continue or just how to just make enough to get by. Cause it's a struggle after yeah. only two years, you're being able to pinpoint exactly what you want to move forward with and the, and the direction you want to go. That's, that's a confident move. And I applaud you for that. How hard was it getting, up from zero to two years like what, what made you take the leap to starting the company and then how well was it from the first year matic benefits from it's young but i'm not um <laughs> so i i did run a small uh agency back when i first got my career started um in the early 2000s far different landscape than when i started matic um so i i guess uh you know 
the benefits we had were uh, out of the gate. I, I knew some people. I already had a pretty strong network. Um, you know, the last decade, I mean, I spent nine years independent before I even took my first real job, right? And that was as creative director of an established agency here in Denver. Um, grew out of creative practice there over, over three and a half ish, four years. And then Deloitte Digital was here and growing. And so, you know, I, I jumped there. My, my agenda was like, okay, let's go get a master's. Oh, Deloitte's here. Let's go get a PhD at like working in big team, working with big brand, working on big problems. And, and, and I had done nine years of small stuff. So I was excited to see big and, um, and, you know, Deloitte was, was very good to me and I got to travel the world and work on some pretty big projects while I was there. And then I, but I knew ultimately I was like, okay, at Deloitte, you really got to be on a partner track if you're going to go for life here. And, and I, um, uh, you know, measured what that looked like and, and at times still think it sounds awesome, but in that moment in time, there were, there was these interesting opportunities come up in the, in the late 20 teens. And, uh, one of them was to join a, a, a small forming, we just raised 3 million, come build our product with us uh, job. So I did this startup and um, we launched two products and three brands in a year. And by product, I mean native apps uh, in the genomic space. We got acquired in our first year. It was just like, it couldn't have been a better startup experience. And yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like the ideal <laughs> yeah. experience. Hey, we have yeah. money and hey, we're successful and hey, we're going to continue yeah. that success. That's, <laughs> that's not the most common startup story, but that's, that's a no, really not at all. But the founder was, was really smart guy. And, you know, he was a really good steward of, of focusing the team, including me. I mean, I was always throwing ideas out from all over. And some of those were well received and others were like, let's stay in our lane on this um, <laughs> and keep, keep our focus, you know? And, and, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so that was, that was a cool experience. And then I, I joined another health tech and, and that one was even larger, much larger and um, did that for two years. So when I left, I left with intention of, okay, I really miss shipping. I really miss dealing with kind of interesting product problems um, from various uh, arenas, not just sort of this health lane I've been in for four years. And, um, I, I, I kind of left because I had a little bit of runway. I was, I was offered the opportunity to support a bigger agency as kind of a lead creative with uh, JetBlue. And so I, I had this like five month, month gig, right, right on my own. So I was on my own, but not really. And I didn't totally know I wanted to do an agency. I just knew I wanted to get out there again. I kind of imagined more of a permalance and then that sort of led into, um, oh, I hear you're, you're on your own, man. Do you want to look at this, doing this thing with us or that thing? And next thing I knew, I was scrambling for help. And, and I was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. That sounds cool. I don't really have a, the time to really do the copy. I better, better get a content strategist in here. And, oh, uh, that's going to need some code. Let me ring up some old developer buddies, see if they're around. And it just kind of escalated. So uh, 21, September 21, uh, was kind of when the light bulb went off and I launched Matic. I was like, yep, I want to build an agency. Let's, let's go nuts. And, uh, you know, the, the big thing was I, I, I wanted to build two models within the agency so that we could sort of support clients from what I saw as mission critical to them. So one is be a partner that can take the requirements. The clay is very wet, work closely with stakeholders and come up with an outcome all by ourselves, right? So a full independent studio. Um, then the other was for a client that um, might not be moving at the pace they need to with their hiring or their team. And, and so maybe, or maybe see that we need a specialty for this amount of time on this effort, totally living and breathing the problem with us. But in six months, we're not gonna need them anymore. So mm -hmm. so we built uh, Matic Teams and, and uh, so that at that stage, you know, the first few months, I'm just sort of like trying to get a few clients, which, which did come, um, and slowly, but surely, and boy, I'll say this, I was very rusty. I was very, very rusty from my days of, of studio and agency and, um, having Rust, kind of, rusty in what aspect dealing with clients, like the sales uh, aspect or just rusty in. <laughs> I, the sales aspect that, that sort of clicked in no problem. It was more, um, defining the project and making sure we had achievable ex, uh, acceptance yeah. criteria. That to this day is still one of the hardest things. Um, even yeah. for us, like we've been 
uh, I say we, I'm the design director, but the team itself was built kind of similar to yours where uh, David, our, our yeah. CEO, was a freelancer. Um, he was a developer and he got good enough to where people were noticing and, and offering him more work. And then he just kind of needed more help. So he would hire contractors to help him out. And then it just kind of snowballed from there that when he needed more help and got more clients, it just became like a business of his. Right. So similar yeah. to your story, but to this day still um, getting the idea from, especially a startup that don't really know what they want. One of our things we do is a lot of pushback, um, not in a negative way, but we'll have an exploratory with the client and then we'll, we'll kind of get their idea and then we'll kind of say, okay, but what if we took that and did this instead and, and try to figure out a, a, a more business practical approach to what their idea might be and see if they're receptive. But at the end of the day, once we start specking out the actual project and trying to come up with yeah. an estimate for time and hours and stuff, that's still one of the hardest things to nail down. So it, it really is. And it, it's such a, you know, it's such an opportunity for AI, I think, to come in and be like, <laughs> you know, take every edge case and start building out models for, okay, because client A and client B with the same exact deliverables will be totally different roads to get there. And for sure. how do you, you know, this whole forecasting model is, is um, it's inherently agency. It's inherently us. We do it. And, and it's so um, difficult to kind of control the destiny for you and your clients of just like, we're all going to be happy at the end of this um, because the work will be great, but maybe the budget was, you know, super under and then the agency kind of paid to make sure the work was great. Um, or the inverse of that is, you know, the, <laughs> the budget, the, the, the budget was maybe too healthy for what the problem that needed to be solved really was. Um, and, and it's just, it'd be, it, I don't know what the science of it is. I don't think anybody does. That's why we're still doing this, the same, the same model of, of take a guess, call it an estimate, sign a contract, you're locked. <laughs> Hope you guessed right. Uh, it's yeah. a very tricky. <laughs> yep. yeah. That is the fly paper that we are. Yeah. Oh, it's every single time. And you think yeah. you learn as you go and you learn, especially if you get products that are similar or even we don't stick to one industry or one vertical, I guess is the corporate term for it. So we like to yep. bounce around to different, spaces just because it's more exciting for us that way it's not yeah we're not doing the same thing over and over again but a lot of times the technology and the product map are similar enough to where we, you know in our heads we're like we've done some, something similar to this already this app does a b and c we built an app that does a b and c and d so we should be able to do this in the same amount of time with the same stack and then it turns out right. now it's a, a b and c is actually a different language now <laughs> It's Q, Z, and F. It's not the same thing. But. No, it's, it's a very, and then when you start getting into the predictable, repeatable models, the, the fun of solutioning, the fun of strategy, this, the, that, that sort of is a trade-off. Like, we just do logos, right? Like, that's yeah, not the and case. then you become a conveyor belt. If you hyper con conveyor belt it and you build the engine, it, it does lose the allure of like, we're doing great things, solving interesting problems and driving dramatic results, right? Like that's, that's the dream. That's why you start an agency. You don't start an agency to build an assembly line generally. Um, so, you know, and one of the things that I think we're, we're thinking a lot about is just what's our success versus satisfaction um, versus obviously revenue performance against things like when engineering was involved, there's always unknowns. There's, there's just a inherent unknowns with, with software, um, especially, you know, the second the word custom uh, precludes software, then you're, you're just, again, it goes back to how good of a guesser are you? <laughs> um, so, so we're, we're looking at, you know, maybe not quite the assembly line, but more of the specializing and, 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 you know, um, we've done things that were new this year when uh, just to finish. So when I, when I launched the thing, when I launched Matic, uh, I had those two notions. And, and then in, within a few months, we had a few projects. So I was mentioned I was rusty, but we got through those projects and it just started to get better. I started to propose better. I started to write out project plans much more uh, coherently and deeply mm -hmm. uh, instead of like trusting kind of in, intuition uh, <laughs> to get us to the finish line. Um, so got sharper there pretty quick. But then the team's business, 
sort of all of a sudden exiting 21, entering 22, it took over. We had a client kind of come in. They said they needed one UI UX designer for like maybe four month contract. They were, they were building a pretty ambitious enterprise product um, on a fast scale and they weren't very happy with the recruiters. So it was my first chance to sort of test this model of teams. Um, they ended up bringing on four uh, UI UX designers for extended contracts. And then four all this from your team or yeah, four? four. Okay. They, met, they asked for one. I sent them five options. They, they, on, they took four they out of the five for okay. contracts. And then they said, cool, we need a copy developer. We need a marketing developer. We need a flutter engineer. We need a QA direct. All of a sudden I had 14 people working there. Um, so I'm like, well, this is, this is the business. This is definitely the business. And the studio was also doing a little bit of work, but not nearly the numbers that, that the, the, the more teams business was. The problem is um, that client in particular, just, uh, I won't get By into nature is temporary. Uh, exactly. They were, they were poorly managing their funds on the top side and they uh, ended up um, uh, kind of dissolving at the end of 22. So it was a wild ride fraught with some really fun, like, I can't believe we just did this revenue so early mixed with, I can't believe we owe this much money because that client hasn't paid their bill. <laughs> oh, wow. So it, it, it was a roller coaster year and I had some health stuff that year too. So 22, it was still just me, by the way. Um, I hired one kind of person to help with the books for about six months out of the year. Um, but uh, the, the client and the delivery was still pretty much 100% me. So you were doing all the legwork with finding the people to send to them and managing. Yeah, I mean, and I, I had like contract help and I, I had sort of um, somebody that was a really good counterpart to me that helped with the team's piece, but he wasn't officially working here or a partner just, just you know, in, in it, you know, as, as he should be in it for the money, right? So he was getting the money, but we, in terms of building Matic, that was sort of me and that year was my focus. And so ended 22 ultimately very strongly because uh, kind of refocused. We did end up getting paid from that client and, and things sort of, you know, the ship kind of turned around. So instead of <clears throat> paying off a credit card or buying a new car, which both things would be really fun to do, um, <laughs> I, I went ahead and uh, um, to define what's the skeleton team Matic needs to go mm -hmm go, go bigger, right. And be more successful and not, you know, and just, you can only do, you can only bottleneck yourself so much on these projects before it's like, yeah. where's the things that I'm being pulled in directions the most I'll hire for that. So out of, out of the gate in 23, we, we hired four people and, um, it's been a really good journey. We're up to eight now. Um, and then a lot of independent contractors are still, they, Many are on retainer, just as full timers, basically. But I'm not quite ready to commit to the full timeness of that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's just you know, when you the second you bring in a lot of people, um, now process becomes more important than it was when it was just you. Now, um, uh, you know, prediction, uh, the ability to forecast, the ability to see what's coming, and right, and and then what can I teach versus what am I hiring them to already know? Like, that's a very interesting, uh, it's just been a, a, sorry if my thoughts are vague, it's just been such a learning year to be totally honest. So, no, so it's, many, it's perfect. Your story is very similar in certain aspects to big pixels story. So a mm -hmm. lot of what you're saying, I can completely relate to. I know if David were here, he would be throwing his arms up going exactly. I know what you mean. That's happened to us. And, He'd have a story for every story you have that probably matches exactly. But just from hearing him talk about it, but yeah, uh, Big Pixel is 10 years old, but we're still going through things similar, like with the estimated and estimating and um, the processes that sure. you're mentioning. The more we try to nail down a process, the more efficient we become. But at the same time, since we are a remote team, um, those processes have to be somewhat fluid. And right. when we are bringing in contractors and, you know, sometimes we'll have months where a client will kick up their, uh, we don't call them sprints. We call them stages now, but basically kick up a, a chunk of time of work that is dedicated to their project. And if they're kicking up a few more because there's new features being built, then we do have to rely on contractors. Um, we right. don't keep any on retainer 
at a full time rate. We do keep some, you know, like part time rates, but sometimes there's nothing stopping the contractor to say like, you know, I don't have that many hours for you this month. Sorry. Right. And then we're scrambling right. to try to figure out how to, how to keep everybody on the projects that they are on and keep those processes <laughs> going while still trying to find more outside help or figuring out how to unload this extra work and, you know, filter it down amongst the team without everybody getting cranky. Yeah. So how big are you guys? Uh, we're 10 Pro- like a pro- Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I think, what is it? 13 now? Um, yeah, 13 or 14. 13 or 14. The, the big chunk of it is developers. Um, and then me for design, Christie's marketing. We have a group of testers and project managers too. I mean, and that's awesome, but it's definitely like, um, and I'm sure I, I would have a tremendous amount to learn from you guys. Honestly, I'm, I'm always like, yeah, let's make friends with agencies that are further down this road, you know, and, and, and obviously, you know, learn and, and share and commiserate. But um, just going back to that, I think it's that, that's, that cycle. What I, I see is like, it's very hard to get to 20 people and be sustainable. And then mm-hmm. the next level, be, and then I, I've heard it. If you're there and you're satisfied, it's pretty good. And then if you're trying to grow the next, you're going to be struggling the rest of the way to get to a hundred and then it becomes sustainable again. And it's a very weird, um, you know, cycle, I think to find yourself in, I, I, anything under 20, at least this is what I felt like is I picture myself climbing a hill in a sand dune and the sand is very slippery. So I, I get a little bit of footing, but it's just moving constantly. And, um, so every assumption that was true in August is being rethought in October and pressure tested. Um, and this is, you know, it's definitely, it's not so much the client work that, that any of this applies to. It's the, the business of running the business. That, that yeah, it's just the operations of keeping the business yeah. moving the way it should. Yeah, for sure. The client work, I mean, the clients are, you know, overall we've had wonderful partners and, that part's great. Um, you know, we'd love some bigger work. We'd love, you know, I can't believe I'll tell you this. So, you know, I did those health techs. Those were both big app product experiences, like super integrated, um, high touch, high focus, high transaction type app experiences for users. And, and then before that I've done, you know, the JetBlue thing or a bunch of stuff with, um, travel and FinTech and, and then my, my studio lead, she's former Deloitte as well. She was on the Chipotle team for the last four and a half, five years of her time at, at there as the lead UX um, on the team. We've done zero native apps at Matic and it blows my mind. I'm like, I, 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 don't, know if, I don't know if you guys have felt that. Doing a lot of web and web is cool, but where, where are my product people at? Now, earlier you mentioned, earlier you mentioned uh, um content developer. And I know Christy was asking more about your content strategy. I think she had some questions for you about that. No, I had just seen that. uh, I think it was September of this year. You had just brought in a new content strategist or head of uh, head of content. And I find that fascinating. I wasn't sure. I find the whole agency style uh, that you guys have set up to be so fascinating because for us, we're only handling the one portion of this particular thing for the client and giving them this gift and hoping that, you know, they're putting this beautiful engine to use with great content that's optimized and you just never know. Um, So I handle our content. I'm putting that out in all forms and trying to find all those blind spots that is just constantly evolving into what will be, you know, digested by people. And so I saw that you uh, had just recently hired and I thought to myself, yeah. what, who is this magic person that you decided to, to hire? And so I started reading some of his uh, pieces and I aligned very uh deeply with sort of his ideology, which was old school, which is like SEO is never going to die. It's the A plus B plus C. There's some real things that we can we can glean from these things and, and not have any blind spots and sort of move forward with uh, confidence. And so yeah. that lent itself to your overall brand because it's very, you know, confident. And uh, and so I, I, I liked that. And I was wondering when you were hiring your content director, what was going on in your head? Like what was this unicorn type person that you were looking for to sort of do all of this for you? Well, first he'll love this. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that, um, he's great. He he is. He's he is a popular uh, guy here at Maddox. So 
you know, nothing's a straight line. And I wish I could say I just saw it and, and knew what I last late last year when I was putting together our, our hiring team, I didn't feel like I needed a traditional creative director. Um, I felt like I can augment that and but there's something I can augment and it's that and it's that content side and content's wildly overused. But for this purpose, we'll say, you know, we're, everything you just said, we're all on the same page about content. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not the copywriting that that could be a component or, or um, you know, takeaway from it. But it was really getting in and, and just leading with empathy across every factor and then and then organize, you know, situational awareness research um, and then knowing how to analytically kind of put that all together, shake that up and, and you know, come back out with like, OK, here's the truths, here's the hypothesis and here's the goals. Yeah, we struggle with that balance, too, I think, is, is finding the balance of how much do you want to give away added value, which you absolutely always want to do the best that you can for your client. Well, also, right. do we really want to go all the way down that avenue and offer those services fully and sort of where is everyone at? And, and once you do that, can we really sustain that scale? So it's a very interesting, a uh, very interesting concept for us currently. So I hear you when you say that. It's it's I think if you're in digital and you're in brand and solution, you know, there's always been creative director copy, right? Creative director, comma, copy, creative director, comma, design, creative director, comma, digital. It's a very interesting thing. I don't think as an industry, we really, you know, I don't know what the term creative director is really going to mean to us in 10 or 15 years. It'll mean something. I just don't know if we can keep slicing it apart like a pie chart. Um, so, you know, for all intents and purposes, we, we threw content on there, but, but he is a strategy leader. And I think any, any more, the kind of work we're doing, it, it's just, if you're not leading with success, you're just leading with intuition and the ability to move pixels. And I think that was okay. 15 years ago, I think it wasn't really okay after that. Um, but I, but I don't think necessarily, you know, um, all UX all day is, is the, I think, I think the, the tip of the spear, I think is, is thinking through what are we saying? Who are we saying it to? Um, you know, what do we do? How do we do it? Like actually defining these really a B truths for organizations and product teams can, can help, you know, set the tone for all the other things. So I just, I do think the content strategy is, is definitely having its moment, um, in, in, in our, in our industry, it's, it's, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see Google put a certification program out for that soon. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's interesting. Some of the clients that we've had in the past, um, they don't know they need that until you point it out to them. Right. So it seems like a, a service you can offer if it's the right fit for a client, you know, some clients don't need it at all. Some are just like, we just need our app to do this. So just build that and then that's it. Right. But a lot of times when you think through why do you need your app to do that? What's your goal for having it this? Why are you building these features? And then finding exactly the best avenue to kind of make that work for them. And then maybe right. making them rethink their strategy beyond that. And then coming up with the, the, you know, the content strategy for that beyond what their initial idea was. Uh, yeah. I think that's a, that's a very powerful tool to have in your toolbox. And if it's oh, the right I, fit for some clients, I mean, that, that could be a home run for a while. One of the greatest things I learned at, at Deloitte, which was, um, you know, there, there were so many, but it wasn't that I came out like, oh, I'm such a better designer or, or anything like that. Um, although I think I, I did get pushed much further than when I arrived, but it was, it was the think, it was the way to think that was really so, so valuable and where we kind of came up. And that's the kind of minds I'm looking for at Matic is, you know, we all might enter a room because, okay, the reason for this meeting today is we're, we're looking to redesign our website. And, um, and by the time you've left the room, um, through, through meaningful dialogue and, and, you know, the right types of questions and the right threads being pulled through the thought, you might exit the room with a totally different target. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, sure. We have a problem statement. Is it the right one? And let's start there. And, and, you know, 
Down. That's heard. Why are you redesigning your website? Well, my leads aren't converting. Well, why aren't your leads converting? Well, let's right. take a peek. Well, this doesn't have anything to do with the interface. It has to do with like your content's a mess. <laughs> your strategy's a mess. Let's let's optimize that. And you don't need a whole new. How about that? Yeah, it's never it's never that. And that's and we thrive on that here. And that's where Gary's saying like the exploratory and the pushback is like you think it's this, but let's just like keep right. digging. And it's, it's probably actually this. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Josh, since you've only been, I guess you could say, in business with Matic for two years, but you do have a lot of experience coming up to that point, um, one of the questions we ask all of our guests, what are your top three pieces of advice for any entrepreneur, new business, or startup? And for you, this can go back to just even becoming part of a team all the way up to building your own team. Uh, yeah, I love it. So. I actually um, have put some thought into this question and, you know, I think there's kind of three that, uh, that, that I, I can't, I like that you're asking three cause I can limit it to three pretty easily. But um, for me, it's staying inspired. Like just, you know, I kind of always have 5% of my brain looking for inspiration. So if I'm watching a, a show or reading or listening to a podcast, like, I'll perk up if I hear something that I think is an applied story, use case, emotion that, that ties back to, you know, either the company I'm building or the clients that we're helping build. Um, so I think just kind of being inspired is, you know, um, in looking, let, allowing yourself, it's very easy to be like, I can't do that right now. I'm too busy or, you know, especially in the early days and, um, but I've still found ways to like find inspiration. And, and, and I think that helps kind of, um, you know, remind you to, you know, see the force, not just the trees right in front of you. Uh, so, uh, the other is kind of following, um, following notions, like being willing to think in hypotheticals, um, you know, ideas or parallels are going to come at us all the time. And I think if you're building something like, um, it's not a betrayal of, of your mission to think in hypotheticals about like, how to get to your mission, maybe faster, differently, maybe, maybe there is a left turn on the horizon that is going to achieve, you know, goals sooner. So that's something I, you know, as much as I think that's why we're looking at, like right now we're doing a healthy evaluation of where are we strongest? Where do we, where do we, you know, roll, feel like we're rolling the dice and, and can we do anything about that going into, you know, our next chapter? Can we, can we do anything to um, roll the dice far less and, and enjoy what we're doing, um, every day. So just following note, and that all started with a notion thought, uh, a couple of weeks ago that sort of led us down this path. So, um, and then the last one, uh, you know, uh, being resilient, like, uh, and under, in, le in less than my first year, I, I, I lost a month to, to being sick in the hospital. I was a single shop. I'm, I've got a, you know, single person shop, um, had a big client, but, didn't matter. They were big. They weren't, they, they, they defaulted in their payments and owed us about a half a million dollars. Um, I had maxed my cards to keep contractors happy and, and, and keep, you know, at least my, my company clean in, in that situation. Um, certainly didn't have a ton of other project work at the time and, and thought I was done, thought, I, th thought I was done, spent a month thinking about being done, decided to go the other way. And a few weeks later, that client did pay and, you know, we were able to kind of breathe again and, and think clearly and, and like resilience did that, um, being, you know, it's okay to definitely also know when it's time, right? Like maybe this just isn't the time I'm done mm -hmm. and like, um, but be resilient in that. Don't be regretful of that. So I think just being resilient has been something, I guess, somewhere along the way from one of my my dad, stepdad or adoptive dad, one of those dads uh, taught me or moms too. It could have been any of the three moms too. I, I don't know where exactly, but somewhere in my messy landscape of life, uh, I picked it up and, and I don't think it's stubborn. I think it's just, you know, um, remembering because if I had given up, um, I wouldn't have realized that well on paper in under a year, I've sold like a million three. Right. Not many companies do that out of the gate. Why would I shut down? Like I, I'm just having a bit of bad luck. So like, mm -hmm. I, I'm happy that I, that I, you know, took the time to investigate that instead of being like, 
who, who am I playing startup guy? I'm in my forties. I got a family. I got to take care of them and go get a job, which is something I was very close to doing, um, in, in mid 22. So I'm, I'm happy that I saw it from the other lens and, and here we are. I'm happy it worked out for you, man. That's, that's an yeah, incredible sure. story. And I'm not sure many people would have been resilient in that situation. So yeah, fear would have come in there, I think. Yeah, it was, it was there. It was there, but and I had good support. I had good support. This conversation has been great, and I appreciate how real you are and how you're telling us the story without the added fluff of my company's so good because of this, and I'm so great because of that, and all of those experiences has led me to this level of success. Success, you know. So it, it was just a, a really fun conversation. Well, Josh, thank you for taking time with us today. We appreciate you telling us your story. And if anybody wants to learn more about you or about Matic, um, where could they find you? So we're at maticdigital.com. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn and I always welcome a, a hello or a, or a new connection or a, or a conversation. I'm in Denver, but I don't really like surprise visits. So let's plan. <laughs> oh, man, I booked my flight. <laughs> Cancel. You guys accept. Oh, All cool. right. Well, we'll post those links in the show notes and everywhere that uh, we put this out on social media and on our website. So people will be able to just find you easily there. Rod, sounds great. That's it for this week, and we will see you guys next week. Talk to you later. Hi, I'm Christy Pronto, Content Marketing Director here at Big Pixel. Thank you for listening to this episode of the BizDev Podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email. Hello at thebigpixel.net. The BizDev Podcast is produced and presented by Big Pixel. See you next week. Until then, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Threads, YouTube, and LinkedIn.